There we go. And I'll start Give the sharing. option to do live um, closed captioning or no? Oh yeah, the, uh, it should be, I think I can do it automatic. Okay. Um, Thanks for asking, Lindsay. <laughs> hmm. Um, Adam, the last time I did a webinar, I couldn't, it didn't work. I don't know what the deal was. It was super oh. surprising. Okay. Yeah, I'm not seeing the right button, but I know that when we upload it to YouTube, we can get automatic closed captions. So um, I apologize if anybody needs closed captions right now, uh, but we'll get started for the sake of time. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, ninth grade, ninth and 10th grade integrated math curriculum um, overview. Uh, we're gonna be talking for about 45 minutes. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like answered, uh, please use the Q&A button at the very bottom of your screen instead of the chat. It's easier for us to manage which questions have or haven't been answered. And then we can also save those questions if we, if we run out of time and we can answer those later on. Um, but we'll be talking briefly, uh, the four of us, about this curriculum, and then there'll be some time for questions at the end. So I think a good place to start is who we are. Uh, my name is Adam Kohler. I use he, him pronouns. I am the Upper Adolescent Program Director. And I'll pass it over to, I'll go in the order of my screen, we'll go Sarah, and then Tammy, and then Lindsay. Uh, I'm Sarah E. Hansen, uh, she, her pronouns, and I am the Lower Adolescent Great River Math Guide, and I also teach um, some electives for the Upper Adolescent. That should go with Tammy. <laughs> I'm Tammy Lindberg, your Lower Adolescent Program Director. I also teach a cooking class this year, which is the best. And Lindsay. Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay. I use she, her pronouns, and I am part-time IB coordinator and part-time in the classroom as um, an upper adolescent math guide. Back to you, Adam. Thank you. So just for clarity, tonight we're talking about the math practices in the ninth and 10th grade. Um, and how integrated math curriculum is implemented at Great River. So if you're interested specifically in hearing more about the 7-8 math curriculum, I think that discussion has already happened. It's already taken place. Um, and it was happened at the orientation for incoming seventh and eighth years. There's a video recording of that and there's a slide deck that you have access to. And we'll share this slideshow afterwards, probably tomorrow morning, so that you have access to these links. Um, additionally, you can find more information using the GRS Math Pathways document and the GRS grading practices document, which document um, this information in a pretty succinct way. Um, and we really appreciate your partnership and support during this unprecedented, unprecedented full year of flexibility, modifications, and persistence. I'll say personally, this is the hardest year I've ever uh, had in teaching. And so we do really appreciate you taking the time um, to meet with us and ask questions and um, partner with us in this. Um, Tammy, you want to go over our agenda, please? Yeah, we've got uh, four things really to touch on today. The overview of the path of or the math path changes, um, explanation of the 910 curriculum, common frequently asked questions, and any questions you might have. So we're hoping to finish up by 7:15 and get you on into your evenings from there. So first, let's just make sure we understand that we're going to use some terms quite a bit in this presentation. We want to make sure everyone knows what those terms mean. So first off is the term tracked or detracked courses. Detracking is a practice of removing predetermined course pathways, usually a high, middle, or low, or maybe it's just a high or a low um, for achieving um, high, middle, or low achieving students in a particular subject area. We're talking specifically about math in this case, but it does in other schools and districts show up in other subject areas as well. These pathways, at least for math, are often determined as early as fourth grade and solidified often in eighth grade um, with little opportunity for change after that. Um, and a D-track course is where um, we get into the idea of integrated. So Tammy, if you could talk about what an integrated or spiral curriculum is. Yeah, yeah. Um, the integrated curriculum is that several math uh, concepts such as the standards like number and operation, algebra, geometry, and measurement, data analysis, and probability are taught and repeated over multiple years. So they're not the old way we used to do it in seven, eight would be an intro to algebra class, then an algebra class, and then a geometry class. And instead of that, we're now infusing them together and hitting them over and over and over again throughout the years in seven, eight, nine, ten, and really being able to 
that's the spiraling curriculum, being able to prepare mindfully the students for access into those IB classes, whether it's the standard level or the, the higher level from whichever uh, sort of point you're at, no matter where you've been at in third grade or fourth grade um, or eighth grade. So that is our, our main goal is to open up all the avenues and access to um, the highest level of math that the student wants to achieve, not that uh, their data in third grade told them, told us we could achieve, so. Thanks. Uh, Sarah or Lindsay, anything to add to that? Uh, I'm noting that um, it's also that the data analysis has traditionally not been a standalone course in our adolescent programs and in most adolescent programs. And, um, and the number in operation has been so, but the point is, is that data analysis and probability is like where the world is going. I'm even noting that um, biology majors, for example, are not using algebra as so much as they're using statistical analysis. So um, a lot of the so-called hard sciences that used to depend on algebra are now moving in a different direction. And so we wanna incorporate more about data analysis and probability. It also helps with media literacy. I could talk at length. <laughs> okay. Let's move on. Um, Tammy, if you want to talk about the sort of pre-2020 model that we've had in the past. Yeah, so before, um, in 20, Lindsay, 2018 in the fall, we really started talking about and looking at our tracked model um, and, and really critically and seeing how it served our students. So um, I'm gonna make my screen a little bigger, hold on. Um, we used to go from intro to algebra in seventh grade to maybe algebra and then into geometry and you can see the path there. And you were super limited. I won't, I won't go through all the arrows because you can. Um, we, the student was limited into what they could achieve um, by where they were placed in seventh grade. And we all know that students grow and change and have different goals as they go through their junior high and high school program. Um, if you've got a student that is maybe in high school and out of junior high program, you know, it might not be a math, maybe it was in science or reading or something like that. Um, so, it was more of a very prescribed path through and the only way you could jump out of the path if you were you know, set into intro to algebra in seventh grade, you really didn't have the option of that HL, that higher level um, IB class, it's limiting your access to that highest level of learning, not only at our school, but really across the nation, those HL classes are um, the highest level of learning. So Adam, detract and integrate a model, where, where have we moved to? Yeah, so this is the proposed model that we're moving towards. Um, so both it is detract in the sense that the first uh, seventh, eighth and ninth grade years are not tracked, they are integrated. And then it starts to be a little bit of a choice in 10th grade in terms of what track or, or path you'd like to choose. So seventh grade and eighth grade are integrated models. And then ninth grade um, starting next year will be an integrated model as well. Um, uh, then in 10th grade, students get a choice of, of what sort of path they want to choose. Math 10 an integrated math is, is still a pre-IB class, but it is with an algebra emphasis. Math 10 integrated math three pre-IB applications um, is a little bit more um, data statistics sort of. Um, and Lindsay and Sarah, please correct me if, if I get the, the, the specific des descriptions of the courses wrong. Um, and I, I think somehow the arrows didn't show up on this model. But um, <laughs> basically, in 10th grade, those two, those two choices are able to be made. And then students can choose to go into really any three of those things of the, of the after ones. So, all right, let me take that back. The pre-IB analysis could go to IB math analysis and approaches, standard level. Um, or IB analysis approaches higher level. 
Um, and then the math 10 could go into either the IB Math Applications Integrated SL or the SL version um, above. Did I get that right, Lindsay? Um, if a student chooses to take the pre-IB applications, they have to take IB applications the next year. The IB analysis, pre-IB analysis folks have a lot more flexibility. Okay. So let's talk more deeply about the um, seventh and eighth grade curriculum, just to kind of figure out what are the course objectives for these different courses? And um, specifically, what does differentiation look like in these courses? So Tammy, if you wanna talk about the seventh and eighth grade integrated math curriculum a little bit. Yeah, um, so it is combining in your seventh and eighth grade year, algebra, beginning algebra, geometry, and then some more of the advanced geometry topics. Um, comprising three parts. So problem solving seminars, um, math projects, and a spiraling sequence of skill sets that are developed by the Math Institute and Mike Waskey, who are two um, very well-known people or an organization about uh, that, that in the Montessori world. So um, we're really tapping into our Montessori pedagogy here um, it is a spiraling, like it says, sequence. Um, so the students will, <laughs> this year we're, we're hearing, I've already done this. And yes, that's the point. You're going a little bit deeper now or a lot bit deeper. Um, and that is what the spiraling is, or you're going a little bit more sideways and learning a different part of this one, I don't know, thing. Sarah, you could give an example, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> And then um, we, we do recognize, especially this year and last year, that our students are in seventh and eighth, eighth grade are all over the map. I was subbing in Michael's class the other day and the students are all over the map. They are just needing so much individualized attention. And that is what this curriculum enables. Um, each skill set includes a mini lesson. There are instructional videos out there, um, structured notes, practice problems, and a quiz. So that formative feedback, summative feedback that if you've been to one of the chats that I'm giving and constantly harping about the importance of both summative and formative feedback. Um, these daily reviews provide a, a spaced practice of previously learned skills. And so what that means is I've already learned this skill and and the curriculum puts it back in. So you don't have the ability to forget um, the quadratic equation like I have. <laughs> so I know, sorry, Sarah. Um, so that's really the strength of this curriculum. Um, I will openly acknowledge that this, as Adam said at the beginning, this is a really hard year and we are coming at it from every angle that we can. Um, so we definitely appreciate the partnership that has been given to us. I'll also say Michael is gonna be here tonight and <laughs> couldn't make it, so. Um, uh, I can, uh, there's a question um, that I think is relevant right now um, okay. in our Q&A about an example of a deeper examination of a math concept on the second visit. Um, uh, first off, I would say it's not just first and second and third visits, it's like a lot of them. One of the things that um, I observe with my students, and I observed, to be honest, the same thing with my college students when I was a university professor, is that doing certain kinds of beginning algebra and algebra problems with whole numbers suddenly ramps up when you use decimal numbers suddenly ramps up when you use fractions because there's this um, skill set in really strong arithmetic with whole numbers that um, sometimes students, when they first encounter a new idea and they're, they're able to use their strong arithmetic sense in order to get through that, but not really see the underlying concept. So that's one example of a deeper examination that using different kinds of numbers in a problem can help the student into that deeper thing of like being able to do that algebra concept. 
Um, so that's one example. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Let's move on, let's move on to talk about the ninth grade integrated curriculum. Um, Tim, you want to tell us about this? Yeah, and then I'll, I'll, I'll introduce it and Sarah, you'll, you'll follow up. Um, uh, integrated math course, again, for our ninth years that serves as the first in the two course sequence in the pre-IB topic. So um, it's required for all ninth grade students. Um, it's using language symbols and notation and mathematics, analyzing and solving problems, using geometry, algebra, probability, and statistics, and developing reasoning through informal and formal proofs, which are my favorite, Sarah. Um, I do remember how to do those. So, um, and you can see the topics that are included, but Sarah, what do you wanna add more for us to understand? Um. One of the things I'll say about this is that it's a really heavy focus on the culture of mathematics as well, and the language and notation of mathematics um, as and communicating how mathematicians correspond um, with each other. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'm developing in this course, because next year will be the truly integrated math, is having um, using the data that we've been collecting um, through our NWIA and also conversations with the seven, eight guides about like say, knowing what students know already and then starting where they are. And so, um, you know, we can look at something like congruent triangles, for example, that first thing. And congruent triangles means that two triangles have the same dimensions and they, we say, corresponding parts are congruent, meaning that they're all equal. So they have the same angle measures and the same side measures. And there's like a thing about it. And that can be explored in geometry, but it can also be explored using algebra and it can also be used in a probability and statistics problem. And so like using those concepts to examine them through th all three of those le le um, lenses means that Maybe if it's the first time students have talked about congruent triangles, they're getting it through geometry lesson. If it's their second time, they've already sort of played with it. Maybe they're doing it through an algebra lens. And if it's, they're like, they've got it. They know how to do it with algebra and geometry. Maybe they're doing it, using it in a probability problem because geometric probability is a really cool thing. So that's, um, that's the goal of this course. Um, and it's actually more true to how mathematicians work. Mathematicians do not operate in an algebra silo, a geometry silo. I, as a mathematician, have access to all of these things in order to be able to solve my problems, so. Sarah? Let's talk about the 10th grade. So a reminder, 10th grade is when students get a choice. Um, they can pursue pre-IB applications. Um, and so that's this first one here. So Math 10, um, or also known as Integrated Math 3, with applications emphasis, is an integrated mathematics course that serves as the second in a two-year course sequence in pre-IB topics. This course prepares students for the 11th and 12th grade um, courses, um, IB math applications and interpretations. So again, it's helping them onto that, that path towards um, applications and interpretations. Um, Lindsay, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts specifically about what integrated math looks like for this course. I would say both of our integrated math 10, uh, we can think of it as a Venn diagram. There are a lot of overlapping topics, but when we do have the opportunity to emphasize, um, this gr particular group of students will get a lot more hands-on experience with technology, such as spreadsheets and using their TI-84 calculator for um, solving equations via visual means versus uh, by algebra alone. That leads us then to Math 10, Integrated Math 3, Pre-IB Analysis. So um, this is an integrated math course as well um, that serves as the second in a two-year course sequence of pre-IB topics. This course prepares students for the 11th and 12th grade course IB math analysis and approaches that can be taken either in SL or HL. Um, and that stands for standard level or higher level um, in um, 11th and 12th grade. Anything to add about this one, Lindsay? I think this is... Um... 
where we think of certain movies that have uh, the people at the whiteboard solving complex algebra equations. This one is traditional and theoretical and about the puzzle and beauty of um, algebra, as well as making sure students get exposure to um, the four math strands set out by the Minnesota Department of Education. Um, another question for you, Lindsay, when, when students are making their choice, we oftentimes think of like doing a hard thing just because it's a hard thing or it's going to get me into a, a good college. Would there be other non sort of achievement purposes for choosing one course or the other? Like if you're thinking about certain skills that you might get or certain jobs you're thinking about? I think it really is um, up to the personality and interests of the student. And so we often think of um, IB applications as students interested in going into the humanities, um, maybe going into business, not going into the hard sciences, um, and IB analysis as a course, if they like theoretical mathematics, they love doing algebra and the beauty of like solving equations, um, are thinking about going into biology, chemistry, any of the hard sciences that, or mathematics, um, that would be, IB analysis would be a course for them. Thank you. So just for reference, again, we looked at this before, um, but just, now that you've sort of heard more about those courses, again, this is what it'll look like in terms of an actual path. So seventh and eighth grade is this integrated model, which, which we've been referring to as Montessori Integrated Math or MIM, if you've seen that abbreviation at all. Ninth grade is going to be a math um, integrated model. And then 10th grade is the choice between sort of pre-analysis or pre-applications. And that leads then into IB level courses um, for all students, um, whether it is the analysis and approaches, I, um, SL or HL, or the applications, which is just at the standard level. In terms of uh, implementation, next school year, school year 22-23, we are implementing the ninth grade integrated curriculum. The following year, then, we'll implement the 10th grade curriculum. So the 22, or excuse me, 23-24 school year, we'll implement the 10th grade. And that has largely to do with our capacity. We want to do small things one at a time, um, and our staffing as well. Let's talk about a few common questions that we've heard just to kind of um, give light to those things that, that there are legitimate questions that we have about these things. Um, so for, oh, I think Tammy's gonna actually take this slide. I'll take the next one, sorry. <laughs> Thanks Adam. Um, what our pedagogy as, Montessori, as a Montessori charter, our mission tells us um, is that this mixed ability aged grouping promotes learning um, for all students in the classroom. Those that are maybe older or have a more advanced knowledge help and hone other skills um, by co working collaborative collaboratively with others in their, their classroom. Um, and that, that practice follows in ninth and 10th grade as well as in seven, eight and in our elementary courses. So um, how will teachers support students with different needs? Um, Sarah, you actually describe this really, really well and um, wondering if you'd be able to answer that question. Uh, sure, one of the things I love about working with ninth graders is that it's a chance in mathematics for them to actually start to make some choices. Um, leading to that choice in 10th grade about which direction they want to go in. And also recognizing that um, ninth grade, the first year of high school, uh, there is biology that's happening. That's pretty intense. Um, there's uh, literature with like really huge ideas. And, and then our civics and our economics also. Like these are four really demanding core courses, not to mention Spanish, and our electives can also be demanding in a different way. So um, I do a lot of choices in walking, jogging and running um, levels. So there might be days that I have a really high flying student that says, you know what, this week, I just wanna do the walking ones and just show the basic concept. And it fits really well with our standards-based grading because you can achieve proficiency with those, um, but maybe not mastery, right? And so like as the kinds of problems and practice go up, 
um, they can show they can get higher and higher in showing that mastery um, further. Mm -hmm. And um, it works really well because I have students who'd be like, oh man, the triangle stuff, I'm all over that, but not, I'm not all over the area problems. And so they really get to make choices along the way. Um, and then also, um, and that's, I've seen that like across all of our curriculum that people are starting to like give those kinds of options. And then I really like giving choices in the summative project because I know uh, they, many of them, if they are college bound, and if that's a thing, they're going to need to take an exam and learn how to do that. And the IB paper exam is a big deal. So you have to sort of practice that as a skill. Um, but I also believe that um, a sit down exam doesn't always get the opportunity to demonstrate mastery or exceeding mastery. And so um, I will, I say to my students, if you want to demonstrate a, like a exceeding mastery kind of thing, you can't do that on an exam. How can you exceed mastery on an exam kind of problem? You can't, you just can do the problem. Um, but you can, if you do a project around the Pythagorean theorem and really demonstrate to me that you know the Pythagorean theorem through and through and can teach it to others. Mm -hmm. So those are the different ways that I've been differentiating. Um, I'm also including, sometimes, Lindsay, I include like IB questions. Like I pull those in to give them a flavor of like, this is an applications kind of question. This is an analysis kind of question um, so that they can explore those. Super fun. Super fun. So that's kind of, um, Sarah, you touched on both like how you in the classroom support the students at all different levels with your walking, jogging, and running problems, content, um, different lessons, choices, and um, expansions in those summative projects. And the students that need more support, um, we have our math interventionist um, is Chad Hoffland um, for 7-9 and Aiden Clements for 10-12. Um, so they support students that are struggling with math, with math um, identified by either the NWEA testing data, but also this time of year and, you know, halfway through the year, we're able to really say like, oh, this student is struggling in this part of math um, and get them the support they need there too. So it is sort of like, I keep thinking like, it's an approach like this when we do an integrated uh, approach. <laughs> Sorry, my clicker, my screen is too busy. Oh, no, I went too fast. Um, so some more questions. Uh, what if my student's getting bored or isn't challenged? And this is a legitimate thing for all classes. Um, which is sort of the beauty of Montessori and our approach to students learning. Um, in Montessori pedagogy, we acknowledge that students have agency in their education. They are not empty cups that we are filling up. They are active constructors of knowledge as well. And they bring prior experiences that we value and use and build on. Um, and students who want extra challenge are always encouraged to take on more challenging problems and are sometimes even pushed to do that. Um, they can also take on different leadership roles in the classroom. Um, and we acknowledge that proficiency and mastery in one area sometimes opens doors for growth in other areas, um, meaning that they are gonna have a full load of classes in ninth grade and that they are going to need to use their whole self to get through all of those classes. Um, and so, um, and that sometimes opens areas for students to, to focus their attention on other courses that they might be struggling in. Um, but definitely there's op opportunity based on the way that we use differentiation in a classroom to let students um, take ownership of their learning and, and sometimes take some leadership. Adam, can I add in something? Is that okay? Please. Um, it also isn't just other courses that you're struggling in, but it's also developing new relationships. Um, it's looking into other areas out there in the world, like social justice um, topics, and then creating action projects on that, or creating different um, systems around the school or different ways that you can grow. It isn't just an academic area of growth. As Montessorians, um, we as guides and you as students and families that go to a Montessori school, you are really 
acknowledging that you are interested in the whole growth of the child, the child or the student. Um, so thinking about like maybe reading is easy for you and where's, where's your growth area? Where is it? And that's what Montessori education is constantly pushing you towards is that growth mindset. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Mm -hmm. Next question that has often come up is, is this going to impact a student's IB path? Uh, this plan was made specifically thinking about success, excuse me, student access to IB. So IB teachers have been, have actually led this plan since its inception. Um, and one intent of this plan is to actually increase access to that higher level math um, by delaying the choice of choosing a higher level um, path later in their academic career, in, instead of sort of solidifying a student's choice earlier on in their academic career. So um, Lindsay, is there anything else you'd add to that in terms of IB? I think the reverse is also true in something that we've seen where a math destiny was set in seventh grade and there was nowhere for the student to go except for to HL math. And by the time the student reached 11th grade, they wanted something different out of their math experience and it wasn't something we could offer. So I'm really excited to offer this flexibility of IB Math Path because of the delay of um, choice to 10th grade and beyond. Thank you. This is a new change for us, and it's uh, we don't take take change lightly because it it can often have implications with other things. And so it's it's worth noting how we're going to measure this change, how we're going to measure the impact this change is having. So we do measure every course change that happens, um, whether, whether we implement a new course. Um, and so we'll be measuring the, the impact of that course during, um, whether through informal observation or through formal data, um, and afterwards as well, thinking about you know, how is this going and, and what changes should we tweak for the following years. We'll continue to use MCA and NWIA data to track students, knowing that that is, um, as, as I'm sure we all know here, standardized testing is one way to collect student data. It is not the only way to collect student data, but it is a helpful way for us to have sort of um, uh, official data in that way. But we also use our observation in, in our own classrooms as well. Anything to add on any of those questions, um, Sarah, Tammy, or Lindsay? Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you just a quick thank you, and then we'll open it up to questions. So first off, just thank you again for partnering with us on this change. This has been the hardest school year um, of my teaching career. Um, and so we really appreciate your engagement um, and your patience with us as we're navigating these changes. Um, and, and as we hope to make this math, uh, our math plan more accessible and greater instruction. Um, so if you would like, a, if you haven't already put in a question, at the very bottom is a Q&A button, and that's the easiest way for us to track the questions. So let's go through some of these questions. And I think we answered a few, but I'll just double check. Somebody did note that um, there might be some seventh and eighth grade questions and some 11th and 12th grade questions. So if you do have those, that's okay, but we are trying to focus mostly on ninth and 10th grade specifically. Um, Somebody asked about the timeline for families, uh, GRS math path implementation for replacement, timeline. Replacement. Oh, replacement. Yeah, I can take that question. Oh, I can take that. Um, uh, we, our goal was May 15th and um, we set that goal actually a, over a year ago, not knowing what this year was really going to be like. Um, I will tell you that, um, all of the eighth graders rising up will be placed into ninth grade math. Um, and we will work with um, an NWIA delivery at the beginning of the year to sort of figure out where individuals and groups of individuals need to go. Um, I'm delivering the NWIA to the current, the rising 10th graders next week, which will help us determine whether or not we have students who are gonna need some extra support in 10th grade through a functions and equations class, which gets them ready for any of those HL or any of the SL classes. Or, um, and then um, we will also, I lost my train of thought. Oh, so that that's in the next week, literally. <laughs> so Excellent. all of the 10th rising 11th graders have been placed in their classes and they've made choices, right, Lindsay? Actually, my pre-calculus students are making choices right now, but yeah. Thanks. 
Uh, the next person is asking a question about instructional style. What is the instructional style for ninth and 10th grade? Um, and I, it's been noted that the seventh and eighth grade uses a lot of videos and video individualized video um, instruction. The ninth and 10th grade instructional style is an in-person teacher-led course. Um, it is not necessarily relying on videos in the same way. Of course, like all courses, we integrate technology. So there might be some videos, there might be some um, integrated sort of like, you know, problem sets done through Schoology, but it is generally a teacher-led course um, that is in ninth and 10th grade. And I'll say for the seven, eight, um, ideally there is more, um, what I'm looking for as your program director is mini lessons that happens. Um, I observe teachers doing it now and they'll split the class. Then the class is actually seven, kids big in that mini lesson. Um, it is a practice we've been using at Great River since 2008. Um, and it is a Montessori touchstone or pillar. Um, so um, I think maybe to touch on instructional um, strategies, I can't see the question anymore. So I may oh, be sorry. kind of tangent. T tell me if I am. Um, what I really like to see um, is that the guide in the classroom has the freedom and the ability and the responsiveness to the specific classroom to lead their classroom in the direction that they, as the expert in the room, have um, knowledge more than I do. I don't know if any of you know, but I am a scientist. I am trained in science and um, how to teach in culturally relevant ways and best practices, but I don't know the best practices in math education through and through or lit. And so um, we all really rely on the expertise of our gifted and brilliant teachers for that. Um, so I know there is a lot going around about uh, they watch videos and that shouldn't be the case. Um, as I said, this year has brought us many, many challenges, um, and it is something we are working through, and we have specific professional development and working sessions throughout the summer to address that. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, the next question is, um, I'm going to summarize a little bit, helping students get caught up. Um, and thinking about a little bit about that instructional style and how that what that's going to look like in ninth and tenth grade. Um, so it will be a teacher-led course in in ninth and tenth grade. Um, and thinking about how to get students caught up if they seem to be having struggled with the seventh and eighth grade instructional style. So ag again, we do have um, very specific supports if a student is at a at a need to get caught back up to grade level, and that's what we have um, the, in, the interventionist role for. If students are identified as needing intervention they're gonna receive that intervention either um, in what's called a push-in or a pull-out model, meaning there might be an interventionist actually in the course, the class with them, or maybe they're being pulled out, getting separate instruction and then coming back to the class. We also, because we have the privilege of independent work um, in the, well, really all, all grade levels, but specifically in high school, it's a, it's a very, it's an integral part of the high school experience. That's a time when students can have meetings with teachers and get ask individualized questions and get that individualized support, and then also use that back in their classes. Um, I'll also add another way, like getting caught up, is the executive functioning skills that our students currently have. Seventh through ninth grade, I'll speak specifically, are much lower than any other year that I have been here at Great River or any other schools in my 20 years. Um, and so a significant portion of the year next year will go to learning strategies about how to do things like keep a planner, remember what work you have to do, taking notes, reading comprehension, um, math facts, you know, those are all executive functioning skills for the seventh and ninth graders that um, probably we can specifically point it to being at home for an extended period of time on distance learning. So, Tara? I would just also like to add, it's the integrated curriculum is a real acknowledgement that um, students are going to be 
at a running level in some topics and at a walking level in other topics. And so like, that's for me, getting caught up isn't as important as what are you ready to learn next? What are you gonna do next? And, and building on that knowledge. And we're in heavy conversation with the folks that are teaching the 11th and 12th grade two year curricula that I always pass on like, yes, you need a trigonometry. We got through trigonometry and whatever it is, right? Like that's, that's the thing that we're doing to communicate to the next, um, to their next teachers that we are preparing them in a way. And this is what we observe in our classroom about what this class of students needs and what they're really good at. Benefit of a small school. Um, someone is asking about um, extra challenges and, and how does that actually show up in a classroom? If a student is, is doing really well or feels like they're exceeding at a class and they want extra challenge, does the student have to get those challenges? Does the teacher provide those challenges? It looks different depending on the course. Um, Sarah's been mentioning sort of offering choice within assignments. Um, that means that basically like here is your, your, your take home work for the day or for the next few days. And you can choose between walking, jogging and running. And they're all gonna be sort of about the same thing but different in complexity. So that's where a student gets to make individual choice. But if a student is wondering about how do I, I've got this idea, I know I want harder work. This kind of comes back to what we were talking about before. Um, and it's something that we've struggled more with than I was really anticipating. Um, students building relationships with teachers so that when they are ready to have a challenge, they know who to ask. And that's something that I think we've, I have taken for granted um, pre-pandemic, that we have really strong relationships between students and teachers so much so that a student can say something like, hey, I really want to work a project on this. Can you help me? Whereas we're noticing a lot more this year that students are really afraid to talk to teachers and worried that once they talk to teachers, they're gonna get a no, no matter what. When generally teachers really want to talk to students and really want to provide interesting, engaging opportunities. And so that's something that we can work on, I think ourselves as well as maybe we need to do a little bit more work to approach those students, where as before it, it had been a lot of students really I think that leadership was just sort of a little bit more apparent um, pre-pandemic and it's something that we are hoping to work on. So a little bit of both. Students can choose those extra challenges and they also, I think, can start working on their advocacy, advocacy skills to start seeking that out by building a relationship with the teacher and then asking for those things as well. Anything to add, anybody else? Okay. Just gonna note that it's 7.13, Adam. It's oh, thank you. Then maybe, uh, were there any questions that y'all, um, I'm just looking at the questions now. And so if there are questions that you feel like we should really answer pertinently, yeah. and then we can we can follow I, up in, in um, messaging. I feel like the there's a question about MCA reports and we know as a nation, those MCA scores are gonna come in low this year. We know that's gonna be in reading, science, math, every single test is gonna come in low. And um, that is our work as educators to understand and lean on who experts are that uh, tell us how to get those math scores up. And the math scores or the MCA scores, I mean, are a test that is written by one body of people that do not re represent all bodies of people, um, walks of life, races, ethnicities. Um, so we also have, there is bias in those tests just to state that very clearly. And so we're also using data like observational data, we're using data from our NWIA scores like Sarah was talking about before, and we are paying attention to the um, numerical data. That is my favorite thing is data analysis and spreadsheets. So, um, Sammy, can I add one thing? Yeah. Um, I highly recommend Weapons of Math Destruction to anyone who has not read it by uh, O'Neill, Kathy O'Neill. Um, and I just want to point out that Great River is a super small school, and we have a collection of families that opt out of MCAs. 
So our MCAs, our dras MCA scores are drastically impacted by like little tiny students either deciding to show up or not show up and families opting in and out. And we also really don't have good data yet from our elementary and um, some of the really hardcore um, interventions we've put in place in the adolescence. And we were excited to get that data and then the pandemic happens and um, we just can't get good data right now with our MCA math. We are watching our IB math access and our IB math scores. And I can tell you that our access, we had the most students opt into the IB math exam ever in our history this year. And um, the students who took it felt very confident despite the pandemic loss of learning when they sit, sat down to take those IB math exams. And I expect even more confidence in future years as students access um, a full two years of IB math after their elementary and adolescent math experience at Great River. You're here. Thanks, y'all. Um, so we are unfortunately out of time. Um, there are still a few questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. So we will save these questions, um, type up some answers and send them out. Um, again, thank you so much for taking the time on a Thursday evening to, to listen to this presentation. And again, thanks for partnering with, with us in this work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and thank you for giving us your children during the day. <laughs> Are you doing a screenshot of the questions, Tammy? Yeah. <laughs> Just in case. I think I got them. Thanks for hosting Adam and Tammy. Yes, and thank you for the, uh, the, 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 what is it called? Oh, my language is just out the window this month. Um, the slide deck. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. Thanks Adam. It really yeah. matches what we got we've creative talked. and got and went outside of Google to get my, my slide deck format. Uh, but you, it had all of the content that we talked about yeah. wanting to put in there and the language we wanted to use. So that was really awesome. Thanks, y'all. I'm going to press leave. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Bye, Lindsay.